so this is a good material to just to go through on your own. Um, uh, you will see that the order quite doesn't <laughs> align with the how we cover it. But you know, especially at this point in the semester, you can just start with the chapter one and start reading through. I think nothing really prevents you from doing that, especially at this point. Like as you're reading through all this, all this feel all this except for chapters 15, 16, 17. Uh, yeah, 16, 17, <laughs> chapters uh, 15, 16, 17 should feel like something that um, that uh, you have seen in our class. And I think uh, looking at these materials will help you get a deeper understanding of mechanics. So what I wanted to point out is I think what's going to come up in uh, chapters 21 and 22. And I think uh, chapters 18, 19, 20 are also something that we've covered. Pretty sure when he does rotation in space, he'll talk about cross product. And all of that is uh, really useful to uh, read through. So again, I strongly recommend uh, for those of you who want to get a deeper understanding of mechanics and all these, you know, coordinate system, uh, formal stuff that I skip. Um, uh, that if you feel like all that material that I covered is too easy, uh, where's a slightly more challenging material, then this is what I would recommend. So, um, so with that, let me look at the material that I want you to point to, to and maybe use the tools that he's going to introduce here to do some analysis of um, damped harmonic oscillator. Uh, by hand. I'm not going to use Sage Math for this entire session. Uh, I don't even have, you know, Sage Math loaded anywhere here. <laughs> so uh, let me start out with the harmonic oscillator. So I'm going to briefly just uh, skip through the sections and um, just to highlight some of the key things. So when he covers this section, he'll cover it the exact same way we are using trig functions because um, he hasn't talked about complex exponentials here yet. He won't uh, introduce those yet, but um, let's just briefly skim through how he covers it and match it up with uh, uh, how we cover it, uh, which should mostly match up. <laughs> do I want to do it by side by side? Let me see uh, see if I can do side by side with our textbook. Uh, uh, I think my lectures will have skipped some things, so I don't want to uh, compare them with my Canvas page. But I think if we do side by side with open text, then they should mostly match up. So, uh, yeah, so let me start from here. Simple harmonic motion. So, okay, so here, let me zoom out a little. So, uh, he talks about linear differential equations. And what he's going to get to do is he's going to talk about with a harmonic oscillator the thing that's going to lead to complete description of the simple harmonic oscillator is what's called uh, equation of motion. That's going to be in terms of a linear differential equation of up to some order n in terms of order of derivatives. But they are all going to be linear in the sense that you are not going to be multiplying x to itself. Like there won't be x squared. There won't be dx dt times x, um, all this will be linear. So when you look at the harmonic oscillator and you analyze it using Newton's second law, uh, let's see, simplest mechanical, yeah, upward displacement to x. And we are also suppose spring is perfectly linear, which means it obeys Hooke's law that you can describe the force with minus kx, minus sign indicating that it forces the opposite way from the displacement. And um, so he's so skipping to thus mass times acceleration coming from <laughs> Newton's second law must equal the net force, the spring force. So that's where he's starting. If you look at our textbook, our textbook, we'll start with some quantity, qualitative description. We'll skip all that, which Feynman has skipped. And then he's going to, um, the textbook, once it's talking about equations of simple harmonic motion, then it'll talk about this uh, displacement. Okay, that's the solution, which Feynman will build up to. Your textbook just throws it at you. Uh, where's the equation of motion? Um, ah, there is this. Uh, no, this is not equations of motion. Uh, the, um, the equation of motion should be the thing that describes the physics of the thing. Um, 
Yeah, well, isn't that okay? Okay, where it talks about period and frequency of mass on a spring, and <laughs> so this portion here, where it starts with the force, so force mass times acceleration. So this equation is what Feynman has here, and uh, this is something actually it's uh, quite quite common to see. A lot of uh, classic textbooks in physics will skip a lot of the fluff up there that non-classic textbooks have. <laughs> uh, if you ever take upper division quantum mechanics and your instructor uses the textbook by Griffith, um, the David Griffith, David J. Griffith, um, Introduction to Quantum Mechanics, Griffith on page one starts with something called the Schrodinger equation because he's assuming that we, people have seen all the introductory material in the lower division modern physics class. And uh, there's a lot of simplicity there in starting uh, with a key equation and um, building up from there all the other stuff that follows uh, so where you know this is like two-thirds of the way through the chap section and that's where <laughs> Feynman will start from uh, so he simplifies this uh, or I guess the way he does it is he de redefines his unit system so that the ratio of k over m is one all right that's fine <laughs> just remember that when you are comparing your numerical result with anything and then um, he then builds up from here. He's going to, um, instead of um, trying to solve this directly, which will take a um, higher level method than what first semester physics students might have, he um, guesses a solution, x of x of cosine t. And in the unit system is working with, where k over m is equal to 1, this works fine. And you, you plug it in and see first derivative, second derivative, okay, that satisfies the, that satisfies your, um, your equation of motion. So, um, so, and then he works through the rest. And all this discussion, I do recommend that you read through it um, and reintroducing this constant and all that. <laughs> and then, um, then, you know, he, uh, so this, uh, this is the solution that you have, it's not the most general. So now he's uh, uh, expanding it, generalizing it. Uh, to consider the situations where there might be a phase shift, and which your textbook also does, um, which your textbook just jumps to, you know, it, your te textbook just throw this solution at you, uh, or it threw it at you a few paragraphs above, uh, where um, so I prefer Feynman's approach, you know, start with where special case where phi is equal to zero, and then uh, introduce phi because uh, phi. If it doesn't have to be zero for the solution to be valid. So he's starting here and he's um, showing for, I think, uh, does delta have to be small? I don't think it necessarily has to be small. Here he's using that uh, trig identity that you you will see us use in other contexts. But uh, you expand, use this to expand to see the most general solution would look like uh, the sum of cosine and sine functions. Does your textbook do that? Your textbook might not do that. Yeah, your textbook doesn't do that. Um, and, you know, it's the kind of, this is what I mean, uh, going through the Feynman lectures will help you gain a deeper understanding of mechanics. Because your textbook never told you that when it tells you that this is the general solution, there's a different form you can write this in. You can write it in this form. This is also valid. Uh, what connect uh, the requirements that both the, this form and this form satisfies is that there are two free parameters, um, amplitude and something that connects to phase shift. And it's gonna here it's gonna be a combination of A and B that will give you the amplitude and phase shift. And um, yeah. So anyways, um, so Feynman goes through the rest and it connects the harmonic motion to circular motion, which your textbook does in a different section. I think I saw that when I was looking through, comparing simple harmonic motion to circular motion. Um, yeah, sure, it's a nice coincidence. I don't know how much uh, utility there is, but, you know, read it through Feynman lecture, whatever utility there is, you know, he'll <laughs> mention that. I don't know. I don't think I ever saw it that being useful. Uh, initial conditions, let's see. Um, yeah, and he talks through some of that energy in the simple harmonic motion, which your textbook covers in this section here. Um, and uh, I think uh, he might not be covering, okay, it covers a forced oscillation. And let's compare how Feynman covers it with uh, your textbook section. Because uh, 
um, handling this uh, mathematically is pretty challenging, which is why when you look at your textbook, your textbook won't even attempt to derive this. It will just uh, throw the solution at you. Here, here's the solution for the amplitude in terms of the driving force and the, of the frequencies. <laughs> like it, it, it doesn't, uh, you know, it says um, <laughs> it is left as exercise. I mean, yeah, you can do it. Um, it will just take maybe about a page of algebra and trigonometry. <laughs> so that's what your textbook does. They have their reasons and it, you know, it's not invalid reason. Let's see how Feynman does it. Uh, he starts with the equation of motion same um, expression for force. Is it the same? For some reason, your textbook uses sine omega t. All right, doesn't matter. Um, and your textbook included this damping term. And um, yeah, it, it so I guess b, b, if you just set b equal to zero, you would get the special case of where there's no damping. So I think it's fine. But let's look at it here. So, um, um, So he has, uh, with this special case, he proposes a special solution. And then, so he starts out with a simpler case, and I think this might be slightly easier because you don't have to deal with those extra terms having to do with the phase shift. Um, now this would have to be right on uh, phase. And you can divide that. The answer to C must to be, oh wait, I guess, does it not have to be the same frequency? I guess it doesn't have to be. Um, mega is very small. Um, but only if we started that just right, right? Um, turn general response, yeah. Also occur omega, you approach infinity, yeah. Okay, just this does the special case then. Uh, doesn't do the the, doesn't do the thing that's more complicated. But, you know, this discussion is, uh, um, as it is, it's complete. It uh, covers the kind of the key um, inside of the situation, which is that um, the phenomenon of resonance, that if the driving frequency is the same as the natural frequency, then you have a really high, resp really um, strong response to that uh, s small oscillatory driving force. So, okay, uh, as far as this section goes, it doesn't use the tool that I want to use to try to uh, attempt a quick analysis of uh, actually this exact situation. But, you know, where this is so complicated that your textbook has to just uh, skip the details. I hope to actually go through the details. So, the section you get to, uh, wait, uh, let me go up, is where he introduces with the algebra. <laughs> this is a really odd chapter title. Like uh, this, is, he's been using calculus notations. This is, you know, calculus-based physics. What's this deal with the algebra? Uh, he's introducing something that uh, sometimes gets really neglected in a, um, a math class. Uh, there are certain types of math that uh, really physicists should teach it. <laughs> and this Euler's formula is one such formula that really you should have a physicist to teach it because uh, this is something that should really be, have been covered in your trigonometry class. And I found that some instructors just skip it entirely because they consider it optional. Uh, they just cover, cover De Moivre's theorem and they don't tell you how it can be proved using Euler's formula. Um, and uh, really, <laughs> physicists should teach it. And this is uh, Feynman, a physicist, teaching the basis for Euler's formula and how useful that is in describing oscillatory phenomena. So I'll just briefly step through some of the key um, uh, equations, and I'll just make use of the result he drives. I encourage you to read it through the chapter and uh, get an understanding of it for yourself. So, what is mathematics doing in physics chapter? Do I talk, does he talk about how mathematicians don't teach it well? Uh, I don't know, maybe not. <laughs> uh, yeah, 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 see here, yeah. yeah. Oh wait, oh, he's suggesting, yeah, mathematics department should teach mechanics. <laughs> maybe, I don't know. Some cross training is fine. <laughs> Um, anyways, starting so you know, read all his whole story. 
So this is really a good uh, grounding to start. You know, it might look simple, but especially if you take advanced uh, uh, like upper division algebra, uh, linear algebra, and what's called something called abstract algebra or group theory, um, it's built on these uh, simple relationships like this. So it's worthwhile to <laughs> kind of study and learn. Um, and he's like walking through all this, a lot of which, uh, as you are reading through, should sound like a pretty something you are familiar with. And and then he will uh, try to s step through some of the things that one might try to do to abstract uh, certain operations and generalize it beyond the, the domain and range that you are familiar with. So he's uh, walking through all that with, uh, you know, um, the kind of, you know, what does it mean to raise to something to a rational power? Um, and then I think he will probably talk about the, like uh, to real number as well and approximating irrational numbers. Okay, you are still within the realm of real numbers. And he does some of these basic calculations to show what that looks like. Um, derive some rule, which actually comes from a Taylor polynomial. But he doesn't use the word Taylor polynomial, I don't think. Uh, when I cover it, I use Taylor polynomial because I'm leaning rather heavily on your second semester calculus uh, material. Um, so all that, keep going. <laughs> um, um, so yeah, so he's developed all this and now uh, he's going to use what he developed here to talk about a uh, very small power of epsilon and at some point he's going to, yeah, yeah this is, uh, um, this can, you can say this comes from Taylor polynomial or um, maybe not quite binomial. Uh, yeah, Taylor polynomial, that's where that comes from. Um, so, you know, keep going. Now he's going to introduce complex numbers. Um, and uh, the introduction is the same thing that you might have seen in uh, your, um, your algebra class college algebra class, you know, where does uh, the imaginary number come from in trying to find the root of this uh, polynomial equation. And that gives you the property of what imaginary number i is. This gives you the algebraic rule that we can use to now try to expand some of the operations we had up there. So, you know, he's working out some of this algebra stuff. Okay, all good, good. Um, yeah, yeah. And then, um, now he's uh, he's um, exploring um, the raising something to a complex power, applying the rules of algebra that he went over. You can separate out this way and look at this, and then um, so you know this is going to be some complex number. Write it out this way, and he's going to write out a few things to, to try to justify the Euler's formula. So you know. Looks, goes through that, um, you know, builds some table here, and then um, menu, let's see. Yeah, so read it through it carefully for your own edification. And when you plot this out, uh, this is what you will see. Sine for the imaginary component and cosine for the, um, for the real component. And so uh, from all that, um, this is the Euler's formula. So this is the kind of um, from beginning to the end, the kind of introduction to Euler's formula and the complex exponentials. And uh, what I hope he will say is um, the, the theory functions that are natural to geometry. Yeah. yeah. Um, does he mention the usefulness of that? Not quite yet. Uh, let me look at the next chapter to see if he makes use of that. I think when he talks about resonance, there he will use the yeah the algebra that he developed to redo some of that analysis. Um, so so you can read through this uh, <laughs> just so that this isn't me just the scrolling through Feynman lectures. Let me do redo some of the analysis that your textbook does just to ourselves. Um, so I'm going to try to um, solve this uh, equation for the um, damped simple harmonic oscillator using the complex versions of these real functions. So let's just start here and um, kind of walk through this uh, um, derivation of 
solution to driven damped simple harmonic oscillator maybe i should do the damped one first you know what let me do damped sim simple harmonic oscillator first mainly because i see that i have 10 minutes and um the driven part uh, might make things a little bit complicated one Two, um, I know how to do the damped one. And even damped one, it's actually complicated enough that your textbook actually, again, just throws the solution at you. It doesn't go through, walk you through the actual derivation of where does this come from. And it's a really simple uh, process to do this if you make use of the complex exponentials. So we are going to use uh, with complex exponentials and with an invitation for you to read the Feynman lectures uh, the main thing I'm going to be using is the Euler's formula that says uh, Euler's number raised to power i times theta is equal to cosine of theta plus i sine theta or um, if we have any oscillatory phenomena like e to the uh, or if we have a any oscillatory phenomena, like something that goes as cosine of omega t, then what we can do is we can represent that with e to the i times omega t, which will actually be this plus i sine of omega t. And if we want to get back to what the original real function was, all we have to do is take this and take the real part of that whole expression. So with that kind of implied promise at the back, that we'll just take the real part, we're going to do all the algebra, all the difficult stuff using this complex exponential function, all the derivative and stuff. There are some care you need to take. Um, you have to be really careful when you are multiplying or dividing. And um, at least for this derivation, you won't see me multiply or divide anything because that's something you actually have to be careful about when you are using complex exponentials to represent the real functions. So, um, so we have this uh, equation of motion. Uh, let me write this up. M times the second time derivative of the position plus uh, some damping factor times the first order time derivative of position plus the term that comes from the restoring force. And, and uh, when you look at the real solution here, that looks complicated enough that like I would never guess this as the solution, or it'll be really complicated to guess that. So let me start from here, and let me give you the physicist's guess to any linear differential equation or maybe even nonlinear. Um, so I'm going to call this physicist guess to differential equations, which is exponentials. I am going to guess that my solution to this, x as a function of time, is going to be an exponential function. More, pre more precisely, a complex exponential function. Now, I do have to be careful. If I simply say complex exponential of i times t, that actually has unit issues. This expression has unit issues here and here. One, whatever argument I put into exponential must be unitless. So for this time to just be standing there, that's not right. It is as unit of seconds. So I'm going to need some coefficient here. Let me call that b for now. And I'll figure out what the coefficient must be. And exponential of any just a number, it's just going to remain a number. And here, you know, this is, has unit of length or meter in SI units. So I need a coefficient here to make the overall units come out right. I called it an a. So with those, let me see if I can erase this. Oh. <laughs> okay. Um, so this is going to be my guess to the differential equations. Uh, you know, I'm just I'm a physicist, so I'm gonna guess a uh, complex exponential might be my uh, form of the solution to my differential equation. Let's see how right or wrong I am. Here's one reason why we guess a uh, complex exponential. One reason is that the 
Calculus is so easy when you are doing complex exponential. The first order time derivative, you know, exponential outside, nothing changes. So really using chain rule, your only thing you have to worry about is making this factor come out. You know, t is linear, so just a factor of i times b comes out. So the first order derivative is a times i b uh, times exponential of i b t. Second order, which we might need, is going to be just this factor squared. So i squared will give me minus 1, so it will be minus a times b squared exponential of i b t. So I have both of my uh, time derivatives, so I can just plug this into the differential equation to see how the pieces fall out and what I can piece together from that. So I have m times my uh, second order derivative uh, minus a b squared. And I can see that all my terms here will have this exponential factor. So I'm just going to factor it out to the right. Um, so I don't have to write it multiple times. So I have that. Um, and uh, there will be a big parenthesis for everything for this factor dot exponential term. Um, the plus b times um, a times i times capital B. Okay, exponential being factored out to right. Plus k times um, a. And then exponential term being factored out to the right. Let me write down the exponential term. I, B, T. So the thing that makes it is solving this equation simple is this. That in order for this uh, whole thing to be zero at all times, um, so this factor is not going to be remain zero for all times. There are some, well, actually there's, I think, a no time when this uh, whole complex thing is zero. So this is not zero, <laughs> which means for this equation to work, the only way you can make it work is by making this term go to zero. So let me write that equation, and you will see beautiful simplification once I have written that equation. I so so I'm gonna write m times minus a b squared plus b times a i b plus k a is equal to zero. Look at this expression and compare that with that expression there. This is a differential equation. This is algebraic equation. Uh, one of the magical things that complex exponential does uh, in situations where they are appropriate is it turns a calculus problem into an algebra problem. So really all I needed to do from here on is do this algebra problem of fi figuring out what A and B are. So, okay, um, let's uh, try to figure out what A and B are. Um, I don't believe I have enough equations uh, here. Um, let's see, should I be able to figure out B? Um, possible. Yeah, 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 yeah. I do have enough equa equations to figure out B because here's this wonderful thing that's occurring, um, which is that every single term here has a factor of A. So I can cancel out A. This um, A is presumably is not zero. If it's zero, then <laughs> I have a trivial solution. So assuming A is not zero, I can cancel out all these factors of A that occurs in every term. So I have this equation here. Minus mb squared plus i lowercase b uppercase b plus k is equal to 0. OK. I have some complex, um, well, let's see. Um, so I have what looks like a quadratic equation in b. So, all right, let's uh, work it out. So I'm going to, this is already in standard form. So what quadratic formula, assuming it works with the uh, complex roots, I think it does. <laughs> I have to double check, but I think it does. Then what I can do is solve for B, which is going to be um, this thing. This is going to, 
let me rename some of my variables. Uh, the way I have uh, my complex um, things memorized is it's uh, my quadratic formula memorized is this is going to get really confusing. So everywhere I see B, I'm going to replace with the omega. That's what it's supposed to be anyway. Angular frequency of the oscillating thing. So, um, and the, in, within the use of the quadratic formula, this coefficient here is the capital A, not to be confused with that A. This coefficient here is capital B, and this coefficient here is C. So what quadratic formula tells me is omega is uh, minus B plus minus the square root of B squared. Oh, good. That gets rid of I there. Great. <laughs> 4AC square root of all that divided by 2A. That's what quadratic formula tells me. Let's plug in that expression and see what I get. Minus b, so it's minus i lowercase b plus minus square root of, great, um, that, so i squared that gives me a minus sign, but no more. I was a little bit worried about having i under a square root. I don't have to worry about it. It's taken care of. There is a way to handle it, but I would have preferred not to. So minus, I see that minus sign coming in, so it's going to be plus 4 times A, M, times C, K. Okay, take that and divide it by 2A, so minus 2M. Okay, interesting. So let's uh, um, solve this out a little bit. I am going to write this into a real part and an imaginary part. So the real part would be this term here. And let me observe a, a minus 2 or 2m into that there. So it'll be, uh, well, minus plus square root of, um, let me write the positive term first. So this is going to become 4m squared. So it'll be uh, k over m. I'm canceling out one factor of m squared with m, and 4 cancels out with that 4. So square root of k over m, and then minus. Uh, b squared divided by 4m squared. squared. So that's the real term, real. Because sometimes it's not going to be real. Um, and then I have my definitely imaginary term, plus i b over m. So referring this omega back to the where it came from, it comes from here. Uh, it's omega is replacing b. So I can uh, do that replacement here. So that b becomes um, what that omega was. So oh wait, can I okay. move this out to the right? So that whole complicated expression now falls into here. Square root of, uh, wait, minus plus. Um, yeah, it's fine. It, it could be either it's a matter of uh, phase factor. K over m minus b squared over 4m squared plus i b over... Wait, did I forget a factor of 2? Yeah, I forgot a factor of 2. 2m. There's a parenthesis here, which means, actually, I get this thing. Um, one of these factors will become real. So this i times that i will give me minus 1. So this is not one whole complex exponential. It actually includes, um, so let me write it out this way, a times. So let me write down the real part first. It's going to be i times i, so minus b over 2m times t. This is a real part. Um, and then let me write the imaginary part, minus plus i square root of k over m minus b squared over 4m squared times t. And using the um, exponential algebra rules, I can separate out these two terms. I can separate this out on its own and have this as it's a separate term. I can have a times expo the real exponential minus b over 2mt 
this looks like some kind of exponential decay and that is exactly this term here that's the exponential decay term i even got the coefficients right um, which i swear i wasn't looking at <laughs> when i was doing this and then let me write out the uh, complex exponential part exponential of uh, minus plus i square root of k over m minus b square root over 4m squared all of that times t and when you look at it so you know it says cosine of omega t plus b let's look at the, just the solution for omega when you look at solution for omega that's exactly what we have here this is the omega that they said it would be so with uh, um, identifying this uh, as the omega the the frequency of oscillation um, the, the solution we get here is exactly the same as this solution here, the complex exponential version. And I did this in um, like a 15 minutes, and I could have gone faster if I didn't explain things. And, um, and so this is the beauty of using complex exponentials in calculation like this. Uh, what your textbook does with the real functions, it's going to take a page of algebra to work it out. And you have to use some trig identities to um, reconcile all the expressions. But um, when you use complex exponential, the most complicated thing you have to use was that was this uh, the uh, quadratic formula. That's it. And um, in a few lines of algebra, you get that. So, so anyways, um, so I want you to demonstrate that. And um, because this is a material typically not covered in physics 4A, or, you know, at least this particular application is an emphasizing the prerequisite material to physics 4A. I want you to give you some, the underlying material that you can read up on on your own would be the, uh, the Feynman lectures, um, the chapters on the, you know, 21, 22, 23, that will give you the written coverage of um, what I think is uh, accessible to everyone in this class. And uh, if you take physics 4B or 4C with me, you will see me cover this material again, uh, where I'm better justified in bringing it in <laughs> for this semester. Uh, I, I do strongly encourage people to check this out. It's a, a really powerful tool that uh, really, um, it doesn't take a lot to understand and make use of.